morning, Blend. We have the pleasure today of having Bill Emmons with us today from the Federal Reserve. Good morning, Bill. How are you? Great. How are you doing, James? Uh, I'm doing really good. We usually see each other at Royal Bank's uh, outlook, economic outlook for St. Louis every year at the Ritz-Carlton. Uh, at so least it, once a year, and we're going to see each other other places too. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, Bill's an economist with the Federal Reserve. Is that right, Bill? That's right. So some of the questions I wanted to ask you is, is, is this, uh, where are we now? Talk about pre-pandemic and now post-pandemic. Where's the economy now? Okay, and let me start off by saying these are my own views, not necessarily those of Jim Bullard, who speaks for the St. Louis Fed or anybody else in the Federal Reserve System. So I'd say right now, things are looking much better than they have at least uh, in the last year. So going back to the beginning of the, the pandemic, you asked about the pre-pandemic, and that's, that's interesting because most people kind of forget where we were in uh, late 2019, early 2020, before we, anybody had really heard of COVID. And uh, that was a time when we had just finished 10 years of an expansion since the end of the financial crisis, Great Recession. So that was notable. And it was also um, a couple other things that, that were notable. One is we had unemployment very, very low, three and a half percent nationally. Uh, I think it's literally even a little lower here in St. Louis. And nobody really thought we could do that without creating some inflationary pressures and we really didn't see that. So that uh, was ver a very, very positive thing. Kind of on the other side, uh, you know, it had been a long, long expansion and um, areas of the economy looked a little bit uh, a little bit soft, like housing actually was, was pretty soft at that point. So then along comes this pandemic and we had the biggest shock to our economy in a very compressed period of time, really since you'd have to go back to something like World War II, like Pearl Harbor. That's how sudden it was and how big of a shock it was. Because remember in the housing boom and bust and the great recession, there was no single week or month, you could say everything uh, changed. But in March of last year, 2020, everything changed. We had a, a global pandemic was declared uh, from one day to the next, your plans changed. I don't know if you had any travel plans at that time last March, but you know it was just it was just off, and uh, you know businesses closed, uh, restaurants closed. Uh, we started working at home uh, middle of March, and uh, I haven't been back yet. So that was a big shock to everyone, and I think because it was so clear what the shock was, and it's. Uh, President Biden made this point, and he's repeatedly made this point. It was clear people were suffering economically through no fault of their own. And under those circumstances, it was not very difficult, I think, to reach fairly quick political consensus. We need to do something big. And so the, the big fiscal package that came out, the CARES Act was the first, but there have now been a sequence. The most recent one, the uh, American Rescue Plan from the uh, Biden administration. So this is cumulatively now the biggest government response to an economic crisis uh, that we've ever seen. And again, you really have to compare this to something like World War II. That's how big the disruption was to the economy, how sudden it was, how completely our lives changed, uh, and how large the government response was. So we uh, you know, bounced back fairly quickly, sooner than a lot of people thought would happen in the middle of last year, but then we kind of reached a, a flat spot and um, there was a package passed at the end of the year, December, and then again, early this year. And that seems to have been a major boost combined with the progress we've made against COVID with the vaccinations, getting those uh, horrible numbers down from January. Uh, we're down about 80% on infections and deaths, still way too high but that's way down, uh, the vaccination is proceeding. Uh, we've learned that we can do a lot of things that we didn't think we could do in a virtual setting. So all those things are coming together and giving us uh, real tailwinds. So it looks like this year is gonna be extremely strong. And uh, I'm sure we wanna talk about kind of what comes next, but at this point, you'd have to say, um, it, and you're hearing a lot about this, You know, this will be the strongest economic growth in 
many, many years. Speaking of what's coming next, along with what's coming next and strong economic growth, what role will inflation play in this? That's a big question. And, um, you know, the Fed's official position is that we recognize there will be some inflationary pressures this year, but the, the way it's being discussed uh, mostly is that it's short term. It's just uh, the adjustments. Things shut down very quickly. Things are opening up fairly quickly. And so there are pressure on, on resources. I mean, an example would be um, if you have bought an airplane ticket lately, you know, the airfares have gone up a lot. That's because of the disruptions and uh, people suddenly moving back in that direction. Uh, used cars are another example. Prices of used cars have gone way up um, this year because people will have some money in their pockets. Maybe it's time they maybe defer to purchase and, and they're uh, looking, for, uh, looking for those cars now and there just aren't enough available right now. So those are some of the, the reasons that you're going to see this inflation. The Fed uh, keeps suggesting that that will pass through, that uh, within a few months, we won't have to worry about that. But I will say, uh, you know, there are people concerned about it. Um, one of the prominent voices is Larry Summers, an economist at Harvard, who was the Treasury Secretary under um, uh, Bill Clinton, I guess. Is that right? He, he was an advisor, I guess, to the Obama administration, but was uh, Treasury Secretary earlier. But he's, he's been concerned that because of the size, the scale of the uh, support from the Fed, from the Congress, that we may just overdo it and kind of overheat. And in the past, we, it seems that when you have a period of uh, pressure on resources, like I'm describing, that people start to expect it and they start to build it into their uh, behavior. Or you know, the, the classic uh, example is if workers see that prices are going up, they're going to ask for better wages because, well, I need to keep up with the cost of living. And that then maybe uh, induces the, the employers to say, well, I need to raise prices now because I'm paying more for wages. So there is that, I guess I, my point is, um, I don't think we can dismiss that risk out of hand that this could result in inflation that gets a little bit, um, you know, lasts a little bit longer than just a few months. One of the last questions I have to ask is, again, you're working from home uh, and yes. I'm shooting from home. Talk about things getting back to normal. Uh, do you think that most large corporations, especially those that are renting spaces in downtown buildings, will keep a portion of their workforce at home to cut down on expenses? And how will that affect the real estate market in those downtown areas? Oh, that's a great question. And I think that's... Um... The effects on, on real estate, you pinpoint, I think, the area where it's most obvious, but of course, so office buildings, but think about all the restaurants and the coffee shops and the shoe shines and the hotels that support business travel, all of those businesses potentially could be affected. And I think, and maybe I'll just speak a little bit from, from what we're talking about here at the, at the Federal Reserve in St. Louis, is that it's, um, I think, the way it's being described is there will not be any increase in the number of people who are completely remote. So that's, that's going to be that if you were a remote worker before you lived in a different city, say that uh, will continue. But the plan is that the changes will be in those people who were previously full, full time on site, that will be reduced a bit. So depending on your work unit, your particular, um, job, you might end up working from home a day or two or even three days uh, a week. So it's not that we're going to increase the number of full-time remotes. We're just going to uh, move toward a, you know, a so-called hybrid model. And I would guess that that's, that will be typical of what lots of businesses will do, that they still will want to see people face-to-face -face sometimes. And it may not be even on a regular weekly schedule. It could be uh, you know, every other week or once a month, you get together for, for some amount of time. Of course, nobody knows for sure. Uh, you know, it's just a guess at this point how significant that will be. Is it going to, uh, you know, be 20%, 40 60% of work that used to be done in the office is done remotely? Don't know. 
um, you know, I think the from the real estate side, the office owners are hoping, I, I suspect, that even if you reduce the number of hours that people are in your office, that, that employers will still need those offices. Now, of course, on the employer side, they're saying, well, we don't really need an office to sit empty for four days or five days a week. So, uh, and again, speaking from the experience of what, what's going on here, there are plans to move from a, you know, everybody has a fixed location at the, uh, at the work site to more of a shared space. And it, it won't necessarily be everybody, but certainly those people who are mostly remote may end up uh, you know, coming in in the morning and you may work in this space today and a different space tomorrow and a different space the week after that. You know, move your computer around, plug it into the network. Um, you know, that's an aspect I think people who are looking forward to more uh, time working at home are now starting to digest this. But that's sort of the downside of having that flexibility is that you lose your permanent seat, uh, you know, in the building perhaps. So that uh, would support employers cutting back the space they need if they can use it, uh, you know, more efficiently from the perspective of keeping desks and, and chairs in use. Um, you know, you can imagine that's a pretty significant scheduling issue in terms of getting teams to be in the bank at the same, in our case, uh, the building at the same time, uh, you know, avoiding everybody wanting to be there on Wednesdays and nobody on Friday. Well, that doesn't match up with this idea we're going to use our space efficiently over the, uh, the time period. So a lot, of, a lot of logistics that are going to have to go into this. And my, my guess is that it's not going to be perfect from day one. Be a lot of changes, a lot of learning, and on both sides, you know, the employers, uh, also the employees, are going to find out if they like that. As I say, coming in and you don't have a permanent spot anymore, you know, you might feel kind of, um, you know, feel differently about about being in the in the office. And of course, you know, I, I speak to our our kids, our children are in their twenties and thirties now, and there seems kind of a different attitude. <laughs> you know, well, if, if, if my, you know, I like this. My son is saying. James Thomas Morning Blend, we've had the pleasure of having Mr. Bill Emmons from the Federal Reserve here in St. Louis talking about pre and post pandemic economy. Uh, very interesting about uh, inflation and very interesting about workplace. Bill, as always, it's always good to see you. And folks, I have to say, Bill does look very youthful today. Uh, he says he's getting more <laughs> exercise, more so than he did. So Bill, thank you again for joining us on Morning Blend. My pleasure.